Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Michael C. Polk. Uh, good afternoon. I hope that you found this morning set of panels as uh, exciting as I found them. I learned a lot uh, from the very, very insightful conversations and from the entire atmosphere of looking at solutions rather than analyzing the problem, which this uh, town does a lot of, but not enough of the latter. We now have uh, what I would call the headliner of today's event uh, to bring you uh, the, na the name that inspires the work of the McCain Institute that makes us the do tank that we are rather than a think tank and that is the work uh, of the McCain family and particularly Mrs. Cindy McCain. I have the great pleasure to introduce her together with Senator Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota. Mrs. McCain is the chair of the McCain Institute's Human Trafficking Advisory Council and has worked together with the governor of uh, Arizona being on her council of, uh, on human trafficking and dedicating her life to combating human trafficking, sex trafficking, and combating basically inhumanity to man throughout the world. Senator Heitkamp has been a leader in Congress in working to combat human and sex trafficking and has been working very closely with Mrs. McCain and Minnesota Senator Klobuchar to end human trafficking. It is my great honor to introduce Senator Heitkamp and Mrs. Cindy McCain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Grace. Hi. How are you all? <laughs> Ooh. Remember, remember SNL? Then it's exhausting. I think I'll take a nap. <laughs> um, I want to welcome all of you and thank you so much. It's so nice to see so many people and so many old friends here today. Um, it's my honor and, and privilege to have Senator Heitkamp with us today uh, because there could be no better person to speak to you about character-driven leadership uh, than Hi Hi Senator Heitkamp. She's worked in so many areas and so many different issues in her home state of North Dakota, but most recently we've had the opportunity to work together on human trafficking and, uh, and get to know each other and become very good friends as a result of it. And that's a rare thing in Washington. So welcome, Senator Heitkamp. I'm so glad you're with us today. Well, I'm glad because Cindy's other choice in Washington was a dog and she picked me. <laughs> There's an old saying in Washington, if you want a friend, get a dog. Um, <laughs> it's true. I think Truby said it, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Um, you know, I, I thought a lot about how honored I am to be part of the work of the McCain Institute and to have the great friendship of Cindy McCain. Um, you know, I think sometimes when you're like me and you aren't really all that involved in politics and you watch national leaders, you wonder who they really are. And I think most of you know, if you've had a chance to meet a lot of national leaders, there's people who are awe-inspiring and great, and there's people who disappoint. Cindy is awe-inspiring. Her commitment, her drive, and her, her grace to which she moves in this lane to maneuver thought in a way that's not confrontational, it's not aggressive, but it is absolutely directive. And, and it's the kind of diplomacy that we need when we need to be tough, she's tough, in, in our states, but I think one of, the, one of the reasons why I was excited to come here is to talk about how this kind of work can really translate to the work that you do every day and the, the work that you take back to your communities and back to your countries. And so I want to I wanna ask Cindy, um, why, why this kind of leadership? What, what do you hope these folks will do when they leave the room? And what do, you, what do you hope this room will look like in 20 years? And how does that fit with your vision of what you'd like to see in terms of uh, uh, global uh, uh, geopolitical kind of advancement in the world? Well, both my husband and I truly believe that the, the way to excel and the way to, to move forward is, of course, to empower our young people. And so young leaders uh, mid-career that are beginning, their, not beginning, but entering their, the, the stream of leadership possibilities in your own areas and in your own countries, uh, this is what we find most exciting. And so to be able to, to, to have the opportunity to be able to, 
to, to, to <coughs> expose, to show, to talk to, to experience with them uh, what leadership is all about and why character-driven leadership most specifically is important because there's leadership, uh, there's experience, but then there's character-driven leadership. And that's what, that's, those are the ones that bubble up the top and really do the good work, in our opinion. Well, we're in kind of a period of nationalism or populism. You know, you hear, hear all the stories and everybody is kind of thinking about how do we redefine our national interest in an environment where global interests are being challenged, the, you know, global priorities are being challenged. And, you know, obviously we, we live in a global world. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about it, but I think that we see these little pockets of populism, and I'm not against populism, I'm not against national self-interest, but it seems like the concept that's being left behind is that national self-interest is not equal to global development and global friendships. And so I, I, think, I think one of the things that always is amazing um, about Cindy and her, and her husband John is that everywhere they go in the world, they're received with friendship, with, with gratitude for the work and the commitment that they've made. And I think that in a time when we're really trying to reevaluate um, where America's position is in the global world, what, what institutions we're gonna support, I, I could think of two no better ambassadors um, for, for global friendship leading to global security and advancement than uh, Cindy and John McCain. They truly are national treasures. Um, so with that said, I, I wanna turn Cindy to a discussion on the issues that you've chosen because I think sometimes when they talk about global interest, you think of about a bunch of guys sitting around in a room trying to decide what, um, you know, what's in the national interest, what's in the, the allied interest. But you've chosen trafficking. And how do you see that issue in terms of building on uh, more global security? And how do you think that advances a broader geopolitical uh, agenda? Well, uh, your comments about globalism and, and, and working together globally it could be no more poignant than on the issue of human trafficking because this is a global epidemic. And so it was important for both John and me to, to make sure that the Institute played a role in that particular issue because of this. Um, it's affecting, it's not only affecting adults, but it's affecting children around the world and particularly here in the United States. So how can we, as a, as a nation and, in a, and as a world, be productive, be creative, be leaders, be uh, the kind of country or nation or city, city that you want it to be if you don't protect those who are most precious to you? So, so in our opinion, um, we felt that it was most important to not only get involved, but as, as you know, this is an action-based institute, but really get your feet on the ground with it. And, and we've been able, the Institute's been able to really shape change and been able to offer thought and, and help and advocacy on, on most of these, these issues regarding human trafficking. But from a global perspective, human trafficking is the, is the most serious scourge there is. Aside from ISIS, it's the most serious scourge. Well, when, when you look at it, um, and I used to say this because I've done a lot of work in in Indian country with indigenous populations. For those of you, we have a Plains Indians, uh, a large population of Native Americans throughout the region and particularly in North Dakota. And, and one of the challenges that we have is trying to um, keep everyone working together. And, and I used to say this, and I still say this, that if we cannot form alliances, if we cannot find common ground in protecting children, we are failing as a society and we're failing as a, a global superpower in, in our country, but we're failing globally. And so I, I really see the issue of human trafficking not only raising the, elevating the awareness, making it, it un, um, taking it out of the shadows, shaming countries that allow it to happen, mm -hmm. shaming communities that find profit in it, shaming businesses that find mm -hmm. profit in it, 
which is one thing Cindy and I have um, been working very hard very on. Very hard. We're into yeah. shaming. <laughs> shaming bad people. that big time. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I also shame see it. Shame and yeah. shame. I also see it, the, the connectivity of children. And when you don't take care of children globally or even locally, that trauma lives within that society for generations. And so one of the things that we've been very aggressive on is taking a look at prevention of human trafficking, but also treatment from a trauma-based perspective, because we, we have a friend, um, Howard Buffett, who has um, who really got into his philanthropy um, uh, with conservation um, uh, work, both in terms of water and, and uh, wildlife, and, and realized that you couldn't do that work unless you lowered the level of conflict. And that conflict comes when people are mistreated as young or they're, they're forced into a life where they, they become the abuser. And so I think so much of this work is so connected to global security. Mm -hmm. But that's also an argument for, for cooperative leadership uh, around the world, but particularly in the United States. Um, there is no room in, in, in my opinion, in human trafficking or any other issue that involves humanity for, number one, discourse, but number two, for not working together. There's, this is not political. It transcends politics. And that's, that's the kind of things that we'd like other people to think about, because this is not political. This is life. And unless we can, can make sure that other countries understand that it's equally as important and that it's up to them to help themselves, and we will walk alongside them to be a part of this as well, um, we can't work globally. I mean, we need to lead on this issue. How, how, how important do you think it is for us to address this problem in the United States in order to have any kind of standing on the global stage, stage to address this problem? Well, we've got to clean up our own house first, in my opinion. And, and we can't necessarily tell another country or another region to do, do what we say but not what we do. So it, not only was it, is it important, but it's, it's the right thing to do. If this isn't political. This is about the safety of our own children. And, and you know as well as I do, uh, entities like Backpage.com and others that we are fighting with every day from a Senate level and from an, from an NGO level, um, until we can make you know, breakthroughs on that, we're going to be going to be behind the curve. But I really think we're going to get back page this year. I really do. <laughs> I got to get that plug in. <laughs> She's laughing because I harp on it all the time. <laughs> I think those are the first words she ever said to me. Back pages. <laughs> okay, I'll get on it. <laughs> well, you know, when 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 you look at um, some of the challenges. We, we went to, to Mexico and spent time with institutions there, both NGOs and government institutions, who were, who were, who were very, I think, um, in the very early stages of dealing with violence against women and children. And I use that broadly, not just human trafficking, but also domestic violence and, and, and the cultural norms. And what we started to completely understand is that the institutions that we've built over a long period of time in our states to combat domestic violence, to change the attitude about violence against women and children, and, and, and to basically create a, a, a society that finds that behavior unacceptable, that that's going to present different cultural challenges where we work globally. Um, and, and we all could tell a story about, well, this part of this country or that part of this country. But I think it's, it's, it's a difficult issue because as Americans, I think we tend to take our context and, and transport it. And, and it really requires a much more nuanced approach. And uh, if you can comment about kind of how you approach this differently in other countries, it would be good. Well, you know, when you, ch and I'll use a, a, a basic example of it. Um, there are areas in, around the world, but I'll use Africa for an example. There are areas of Africa that believe that a, a young sexualization of a child is okay and can be actually spiritual. Now, we as Americans do, don't agree with that at all, obviously. So it's about protecting children, but getting through, breaking through all of the different the differences that we have to reach a common ground regarding children. Um, so it, it's, it's been, I'll tell you, the biggest frustration for me is not, because I have a tendency to have no patience at all, 
and kind of, kind of, you know, going like running through the glass anyway, uh, is to is to back off and really take a, a further look at where we're at and how we can actually wind this down the river to make the right to help them make the right decision on this. But again, we have to start here. Well, and, and that's why um, this opportunity to visit with all of you um, who are part of this wonderful global leadership initiative and to say, look, we aren't here to give you a formula and say, here, apply this. We're here to hear from you in your communities, in your countries, what, what it's going to take and how we can be helpful in a, on a global level and how the Institute can be helpful in, in changing perceptions, changing norms, and addressing this issue from a place that is sensitive to the, unique, uh, uh, the uniqueness of your countries, but also, I think, um, says pretty clearly that there's a global imperative, there's a moral imperative that's at stake here, and that you don't do this to children, and you, don't do, you don't, do not enslave people. And that's what this is. This is slavery, modern day slavery. And regardless of where anyone comes from, we should be working collectively to eradicate slavery from our communities and mm -hmm. our countries. And this is certainly the case in not only, not only sex trafficking of children or, or sexualization of children, but also labor trafficking. It's very, the slavery, slavery involved in labor trafficking is indeed a, 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 a a terrific problem around the world, and the Institute is becoming very active in that with Howard Buffett's help on this. Well, I, and I, I think that's one of the difficulties we have in our country because we don't see it. Um, some of you may be familiar with my state. We just under, uh, we've just undergone a transformation. We've become the third largest oil and gas producer in the country. We've gone from being 11th to third because of the shale revolution. We had a workforce shortage. We had a lot of young people with a lot of extra money on their hands, and we had an influx of trafficking. And I'm convinced that, that we were very aggressive and have been working very hard to provide resources and support for our sex trafficking victims. But I think we have many, many labor people who have been labor trafficked in our community that go invisible. And it's a terrifying thing to be in a country or in a state like North Dakota where no one speaks your language. We're very, you know, we are not multilingual in North Dakota. Um, and you have all your papers taken away. You have no identity and you have no out. Recently, I was, uh, my sister runs the Runaway and Homeless Youth Program in North Dakota and she was called by a woman who does domestic violence work on the reservation. She had four workers who um, were from Haiti who were, who were trafficked, labor trafficking. So, so this happens, and, and it happens every day in our communities, and we don't see it. But we believe that we need to be the example that's going to um, uh, change the paradigm and really heighten the awareness of slavery globally. May I also say that, that with regards to sex trafficking particularly, this is not a woman's issue. So for our male leaders in the room, please know that your voice and your activism on this particular issue is imperative because you represent the customer. You represent the people that are buying, buying these children. Um, so, so male voices are extremely important in this issue. And, it, and I, I strongly say this is not a woman's issue. This is a human rights issue. You know, yesterday um, just released a movie called I Am Jane Doe, recommend it to all of you. Yeah. It's about um, the work uh, uh, kind of nationally to bring Backpage to account for, the, for the, uh, their role in uh, human sex trafficking, especially of minor children. And, and when, you, when you kind of look at the, the trajectory of that work, I will tell you that we have a lot of work to do. Um, you will be appalled by what you see from judges in this country with a boys will be boys attitude. And so one of the most important things that anyone can do is stand up and say, not me. Well, in the movie, you know, you're, you're entertained by, not entertained, but you're told that one out of every seven males um, engage in, in purchasing commercial sex in this country. Online personally. Yeah. 
Yeah, purchase. It's become invisible. And when it, when it went off the street corner and went on to the internet, it became epidemic. And we have to have judges, we have to have people in communities, we have to have people in countries saying, it's not okay. It is not okay. And that comes to awareness and training and <laughs> education, which all of you can do in your own countries on this issue. Um, and, and most importantly, realizing, as you just said, that these victims have become invisible. And, and not only making, allowing these vi victims to no longer be invisible, but to, to, uh, re to make sure that they are safe and recovered in a trauma-based care, which you made the point so eloquently. Well, Cindy, when, when you look at this, how much does economic empowerment in general and anti-poverty work play a role in stopping trafficking? I think it plays a huge role because uh, no little girl in any country, it doesn't matter, wants to say, gee, I want to go sell myself. That's what I want to do. I want to sell myself because that's how I'm going to support my family. But in, in too many cases, that's their only option. So economic empowerment for young, young girls, young women uh, around the world, and for men, I might add, around the world, is most important. It plays, an, it plays a key piece in this whole, in this whole discussion. Um, that economic empowerment and, and, and the respect and honor of human rights, basic human rights and dignity. Well, I, I mean, I think it's, it, in, in many times, people only see that as an option. We've been studying the situation in Nigeria um, uh, and, and planning a, a trip to Nigeria at one of these points. But, but I think um, it brings to mind that the Nigerian girls are trafficked into a market into Italy. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've um, been very hopeful about the Pope, yes. about yeah. the Pope's involvement in, in anti-slavery work, um, and uh, very hopeful that we will find more spiritual leaders within other faith communities like the Pope who will be willing to speak up and be part of the movement. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's critically important um, when we're evaluating uh, um, how, how do you talk to people where they live, kind of. Oh question. yeah, well faith-based elements are extraordinarily important in this because all too often that may be the first entry to be able to talk to or expose or highlight or help anyone. So the involvement and the cooperation of our faith-based entities are most important on this, and I can't stress that enough, uh, because uh, if we don't, uh, the spirit of cooperation is non-existent, in my opinion. I, I think if you read the story of what's happening in Nigeria, there's elements within their, their uh, cultural framework that play a role in controlling someone who's being trafficked because they truly believe that, that there will be injury done to them, injury done to their family, that curses that would be on them mean that they have to be obedient. Um, can we talk a little bit about rescue? Because um, we've been uh, certainly in places in Central America where we've seen um, young girls who, um, 12, 13, 14, who really are only sheltered because they are witnesses to a crime and, and they're waiting to work them through the, pros, uh, the prosecution system, prosecutorial system, but, but <coughs> we lack resources mm -hmm. to help recover victims of assault. So, so I would tell you the two things we ought to be talking about is prevention, which is education, which is cultural changes, which is doing this, but also that piece of recovery so people know that there's hope. How hard is that to, to develop that piece, Cindy, either in this country or globally? Um, it, it, in my opinion, I think it's, it's difficult. It was more difficult than I thought because I assumed when we began all of this that, oh, well, everybody will understand, but really they don't. So it takes an element of education, awareness, training, um, it's a building block you start with your, you know, you begin with the people that are the front line folks, the police, the fire, the medical, et cetera, and then you build on that and getting to the community and enabling the community to not only understand what's going on and understand what they're seeing and more importantly how, to, how their resources can help in long-term care. We are lacking so much in the la We have no long-term care, in my opinion, that's, that's adequate, fulfilling, and, and 
does what it's supposed to do. Uh, we, there's pieces. We're all kind of pieced together, and some of us don't work together, and some of us do. And uh, this, that's why we talk about leadership and cooperation on this particular issue. It's critical. Um, and we just don't, we're not there yet as a nation, in my opinion. I don't know. And we have had a lot of discussions about victims that you've worked with mm -hmm. who have had enormous uh, problems transitioning. Yeah. Number one, there still is a lot of shame. There's a lot of self-loathing and blaming, and it's really hard to, to get people over, you know, say it's, it's not your fault, you are the victim, because they've been told. They've been conditioned by whoever is their trafficker to believe that they have no human value. And so this is long-term recovery and, and very, very, very difficult work. And you've shared with me some stories of women in Arizona who have really struggled, struggled in recovery in spite of knowing you and knowing all the resources have really found it difficult, difficult. to transition out of the life. Yeah. Well, and also you still have, uh, much less so now in my own home state, I'm happy to say, uh, but in other places, you still have them have these victims being criminalized. They're treated as criminals rather than victims. That what what begin in that entails what that entails is changing legislation, changing language, changing understanding, and changing uh, and changing attitudes. And I'll for a perfect example because we just made a, a huge stride in Arizona, in my opinion. Uh, there's a piece of legislation pending right now that I've been told is going to pass 100% uh, in the state legislature, which is unheard of. Um, but it removes the word prostitute as it applies to a child. No child is a prostitute, but that change in the statute will, will enable this child to now get services, be treated as a human being, be treated as a victim, and not as a criminal. That's imperative in this. So can I ask you, there's, there's a lot of wonderful people here who care a lot about um, their communities and their countries. What, what piece of advice can you give them if they say, I really want to do something about this, Mrs. McCain, what, what, what should I do? Can you give them a couple suggestions on things you'd love to see them take back from this program? Well, first of all, educate yourself on it either through the Institute on our online services or others, Homeland Security. There's plenty of other NGOs that are out there that work on this issue. Educate yourself first. Educate your family second, and then build from there your communities, your offices, your, your uh, legislatures, whatever it may be, whatever background you come from, and then begin to train. Training means looking, looking out, trying looking through different eyes to see who these victims are. You might recognize them, you might not. And also part of that process is getting help for them, reporting it. For, for, for instance, here in the United States, we have reporting capabilities. Uh, but it begins with you. It begins with you understanding what the issue is and training yourself on the issue. And then... Can you share your story, your story in India? Oh, yeah. That is an amazing story. Oh. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have four children. And our youngest is a daughter that we adopted from Bangladesh. And she's 25 now and gorgeous. Uh, but I was in Calcutta about 10 years ago working on a project that I had going there. And uh, it was the end of the, end of the period we are going to be there. And, of course, I was on my way out of the country. But I wanted to stop and buy some sari material for my daughter and bring it home as a gift. And so I was in the kiosk and, you know, haggling. And, you know, Calcutta's noisy and dusty. And it's all very exciting, actually. I love it there. But um, so I was busy, busy uh, buying it, and I heard this kind of noise coming from beneath the floorboards. And I asked the, the owner, and I said, what, what is that? What's going on? He goes, well, it's my family. They live below the floorboards. Very interesting, very plausible. Very, I have no reason to not agree with that. And as I began to pay and paid up and was ready to roll, um, I could kind of see through the slats and the floorboards, you know, a little bit where you could see, and I could see all these little sets of eyes looking up at me. And I knew they were children. They looked like little girls, although, uh, you know, but there were a whole lot of them. And I, I didn't know what to do. And I'm ashamed to say, you know what I did do? Got on my airplane. Flew back to Arizona, my nice little flight, to my nice little house with my wonderful family, and didn't do anything. Primarily because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand it. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know what to do. And so that began 
uh, a search in my own mind and in my own heart as to what this issue is and why and how we should be involved in it, and only to find that it is an epidemic and it is tragic and we have got to stop this. We have to. I think um, for me one of the challenges, uh, probably a lot like Cindy, I just think everybody should be morally outraged and make this their number one priority and go just gangbusters and apply all, right? apply all the things that we're, we're, we're doing here and just, just create an army. And, <laughs> I, and I, think, I think that that's not, it, rushing into this isn't going to work. We have to understand where we're working to solve this problem. We have to understand the system, but we cannot be patient. Does that make any sense? That, that you, 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 you know, the movement has to be direct and aggressive, but it has to be smart. Because all we can, we can, we can hurt more than, uh, the first rule should be do no harm. And I think the second rule is, for me, is that there is no culture in this country that supports slavery. And we have to be an army against slavery. And we have to make sure that we will not let this happen. And the, the, the benefit beyond human capacity and one life being affected by the work that you do, the benefit is we change the world when we change how we treat children and how we treat women and we, how we treat people in poverty. We change the world. And that's really the lesson that I think we wanted to give today, which is, Yes, this is an issue we're passionate about. This is something we're working on. But it also fits in that broader geopolitical advancement of, the, of, of humanity on this globe. And so I want to thank Cindy for inviting me. Um, we're we're ca counting it down. Um, I love, love being part of this because it is inspiring. She is inspiring. And I want to thank you all for listening to us. Thank um, for you. The last half hour. Thank you. Thank you.